Hey, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the first day of Cloud Native Security Con. I expected a round of applause for that. Yeah, Alex, back there, you got the right idea. Uh, yeah, I, I know it's the last session of the day. Thank you all for coming. Um, there's just too many of it. It was like three less people. I just go around and we just have a conversation instead of doing this talk. But there's just enough of y'all do the talk. Um, I do have stickers up here. So if you want this logo sticker, the shiny one, or one that says Get Guardian, come up and get them afterward. Take as many as you want, because I got to haul them back with me if I don't get rid of them. Um, but let's jump in. So I'm Dwayne. I live in Chicago. I flew out here for this. Uh, been a developer advocate since about 2016. I used to work for a company called Pantheon. That guy over there did as well. Uh, this guy's just walking in. Um, Hit me up on Twitter uh, or Mastodon and MC Duane. I'm on Mastodon Social, but if you look at my Twitter, it directs you to Mastodon Social. Um, happy to talk about anything tech, but I'll also like to talk about improv and punk rock, uh, rock and roll in general, karaoke. If anybody wants to do karaoke later, let me know. I work for a company called Git Guardian. Anybody here know Git Guardian? Awesome. We are secret management, our secret detection and remediation primarily. So if people hard code their secrets. That's what we're helping people with. But we're also a platform helping people do other things, like IC vulnerability. Later this year, you'll see more and more stuff from our platform around stat static code analysis. But I'm not here to talk about any of that. I'm here to talk to you about something that actually I'm passionate about. Uh, I'm not that deep into security. Like You've seen and heard from a lot of experts here today. A lot of people have been doing security for 20 plus years. That's not me. Instead. I got a crash course in this stuff over the last six months of my life, and uh, that's what inspired this talk. So what does good security actually look like? I think it looks like this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, I'm not worried the alarms are going to go off at 3 in the morning. Uh, I'm not worried my perimeter's been breached. Good security means I can go camping and not worry about the house burning down. Means I can go to my favorite concerts and not have to leave before the main act or the encore because an alarm bell went off. And ultimately, I get to spend time with people I love doing something that I want to do. Look a look on those kids' faces. They are so happy to have their parents home. And that's what good security looks like to me. Because all technology has a human cost associated. Whether we admit it or not, we can talk about S bombs till the cows come home. We can talk about automation. But at the end of the day, it is human beings doing this stuff. So what does bad security look like if good security looks like that? Well, I'll invoke Tolstoy here. All happy families are alike, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But there are some commonalities. Uh, we've all lived through Apache, log for shell. I won't beat this up anymore. Uh, it's very old at this point, 2021. Um, but Uber from last year, who remembers this? It was a 19-year-old kid in the Lapsus group, pwned Uber just because he could. He got another Slack channel, even bragged, hey, I own this thing now because I, you left your passwords in PowerShell scripts. They didn't believe him. So he went to the New York Times, and that's how we found out about it. Just a kid causing trouble. And then uh, who fell victim to this? Who has Circle CI in their infrastructure somewhere? Probably not anymore. Um, waking up on January 12th to be, uh, have all your tokens just revoked. Or no, 4th was when the revoke happened. Like, that affected my company. Like, all of a sudden, the system just wasn't there anymore because they wasn't able to access it because, hey, we got compromised and we just had to rotate this stuff. Still ongoing investigation. The full scope of this still isn't known. Who all is affected? What customers with Circles have been affected? Still a mystery. But we can all agree, these are pretty unhappy people overall because they're dealing with this. And these are 24-hour shifts of like figuring out what to do and dealing with really, really unhappy customers. And security teams are really outnumbered out there. Um, Alex Rice said it very succinctly. In the best of organizations, developers outnumber security teams 100 to 1. That is 100 developers to one little security alarm over there. Just putting that in perspective of what that actually looks like. And again, this is the best of organizations. So what do we do? We just shift left. Let's make everyone wear the security hat. Uh, that's, I think, the fear of shifting left. Like, what shifting left is supposed to mean is a little bit different than how I think a lot of people interpret it, especially from the gut reaction of developers who are like, okay, it's one more thing on my plate. 
okay, I have to do one more thing to implement, one more API to worry about, one more dashboard, one more, and I'm already fighting Kubernetes full time, because man, everybody loves Kubernetes. Um, it's only so many hours in the day. So from the dev perspective, like, I can't just focus on that. And from the business perspective, who's paying for this stuff? Business perspective, I think, looks like this to security. I think it's getting better as more um, executives and more boards know what like SBOMs are, thanks to a presidential executive order. But it, security typically looks like that. Hey, we got breached. Let's focus on security. Hey, everything else slowed down. Let's speed it back up. And let's go through that vicious cycle until, well, that's where we're at. And sure, there's a tool for that. Somewhere, one of these does something. We're on there somewhere, I think. Uh, and this is what I think it feels like in security overall, especially if you're a developer at a smaller shop, especially if you are feeling by yourself, you're isolated, especially if you're remote. Uh, who here has ever read uh, Through the Looking Glass? If you haven't read Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, read them. They're tremendously good books. It's a brain cleanser. They're just nonsense. It's wonderful, wonderful mathematic nonsense. But it's true. We have to run as fast as we can just to stay where we're at. And to get anywhere else, we've got to run twice that fast. That's exhausting. And that's why I think the industry has such crazy high turnover. That's why everyone, it's like 90% of people in America are looking for another job right now. This is why, I think, in part. And I think everyone that just saw all of that and is processing it is thinking in their head, well, wouldn't it be nice if there were just a group of really nice people that just would help me with all of this? Well, there is. It's called OWASP. Who here is a member of OWASP? Yay! You probably didn't need to come to this talk. Uh, who here is familiar with OWASP? Yeah, more hands. Who here could explain OWASP to an audience? <laughs> well, that's what I'm doing, literally, so that I hope I can do it. Um, OWASP stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. Started over 20 years ago. In fact, this is the 20th year. Uh, 21st year, depending on when you count dates and how the, all that. But anyway, they're a, benevolent, a, benevol, ah, they're a nice group of people that do nice things. Um, they have a mission, no more insecure software. But as we saw from one of the keynotes, there's no such thing as secure software. All software is insecure. But if you set out with the mission of like, hey, we got to stop insecure software, that's a good mission. Because that is a non-stop mission. And why not get there? It's a journey, not a, hey, we'll one day reach a peak. If you go read their mission statement, it's really well thought out. They argued a lot in meetings over this, I'm sure, for years. But they got to this. I'm not going to read it out loud. It's pretty long. But you read this, you go to their website, you find this, and then I think everyone I've talked to that has hit their website says this. Uh, yeah, but what do I do with this? How do I, what, this is a great website and all. How do I navigate this thing? Even Mark, uh, Shuli, um, Chowley, give me just a second. Uh, Mark Chirpy, Chirpies, Mark Chirpies, sorry about that, uh, said in an interview last year, he was one of the founders of OWASP, said, um, uh, the organization has become a Byzantine labyrinth that new people cannot navigate. And that's one of the reasons he stepped away. Uh, I don't think it's that bad. I think it breaks down to like, hey, they do these five things. And all these five things are really, really deep. And that's like why I think people get confused. So I'm going to break these down and then talk about how to get started from where you're sitting. So first is projects. This is the thing they're known for. The big one they're known for is their top 10. We'll get to that in a bit. But basically, a project is just an open source repo you can contribute to or go pull code from or go look at, go examine. Volunteers built it. Some of those people are experts. Been doing this for 20 some years. New stuff comes in all the time. I just updated this, and I'm not 100% sure these numbers are right. But I just updated this yesterday, or Monday. Um, 250 total projects in any conceivable state. 157 in a usable state. And what do I mean by usable? They're in one of these states. Flagship projects. Production projects, uh, there's no production projects right now. But that's something they invented in October of 2021. I don't know, October 2022. Say, nobody knows what flagship means. So we're going to make a whole new category called production-ready projects, 
production projects, and we'll move flagship projects over there once they qualify in. We're in January of 2023. So far, nothing's qualified in because it's the crazy giant list of things you have to check off. And even top 10 doesn't qualify at the moment. A zap doesn't qualify because of all the bugs, but we'll get to that later. Um, lab projects. And then uh, incubator projects. Then there's a whole bunch of others that don't fall in anything like that. So there's 18 flagship projects currently. These have some kind of serious strategic value. If you're going to start anywhere, start with these flagship projects and just roll through them and say, hey, could I use this? But that's still putting a lot of weight on you. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get to that later. Uh, 34 lab projects. Labs aren't quite flagships, but they're being worked on. They have a website. They got a bunch of stuff in their repos but they're not quite ready for to be like, this is what OWASP is known for. But they still have a lot of value. But some of these are very specific to languages like Python and whatnot. Then you have incubators. These are on the way to be in lab, a lot more of them. If you're gonna go make an impact in an open source organization, this is where I would direct you first. All of these have pull requests that are waiting to happen. All of these have beginner friendly, they need documentation like crazy. Development's underway. And then there's a whole bunch that just don't fit in there. So that's the first way that they organize them is by projects or categories, I should say. Categories. Then they also organize them by types. So you can go and say, hey, I want to work on a tool, or I need a tool, or I don't look at documentation. And they laundry list it this way as well without much explanation. And you might notice, fun fact, these numbers add up to more than 157. Remember I said earlier, there's 157 in a usable state. Why is that? I don't know. I wish someone could explain that to me. If you know the answer to that, please have a conversation with me afterward. Uh, but this is the state of OWASP right now. Um, but, but they said, hey, I recognize this is a problem. We need to make it more usable for everyone at home. So this is the software development lifecycle in their opinion. If you go look at it, it's a nice map, interactive. You can say, all right, I am at the design phase. Those four projects might help me out. I'll go investigate there first. This is on their website. You can go play around with it. Along the way of building this, they invented the CRE, the Common Requirement Enumeration. OWASP CRE became a project into itself, like everything else. Uh, OpenCRE.org. If you don't visit any other website after this, Put this like third on your list. Um, but it's a way to very quickly see, hey, I have a high level um, concern, a high level topic I need to drill into. Quick way to see INST and CWEs and all the other acronyms. They strung it together in one nice resource for you. So that's the first way I think you can start thinking about OWASP is projects. It's a lot of them. There's a lot there. But it's, it's a good way in. Maybe the better way in is get involved in the community. And don't worry about the global history, 20 year history of projects. And just go talk to people. Chapters are all over the world. And just like we're here in Seattle, you can just go hang out with people. This is what it looks like in Paris. Back in October, this is in the Git Guardian offices. Git Guardian is based in Paris. Uh, but this is the OWASP meetup in, in Paris. Uh, who here lives in Seattle? One person. Yeah, you got uh, Lunch and Learns uh, coming up on this, uh, this coming Wednesday. Um, it's online, so you can, everyone in the room can join, join in. In fact, a lot of the community meetups are online, or some of them are, I should say. It used to be a lot more, but then they've slowly been transitioning. I was going to the, like, the, Bisa, or the um, Ottawa chapters for a while, but then they stopped doing them online. Uh, but it's people you can go talk to about security stuff, just other security nerds. They also hold events. Uh, they big global events, AppSec days, which are smaller events, and then partner events where they don't actually run the event, but hey, if you're an OWASP member, you get a discount or something nice happens. Next big one is in Dublin in two weeks. A whole bunch of training, uh, but the AppSec day is in, uh, the next big AppSec day, I should say, is in Ireland. Uh, education or training. You can just Google or DuckDuckGo or 
u.gov or whatever you want to use, um, search for OWASP education and training, you're going to run into a list like this. And you're going to find, wow, there's a lot of resources. Because every good-hearted soul who, I wish more people knew about this, probably started a project at one time and started trying to train people on that specific topic. But there's one org they partner with, and I'm not here to sell you on them, but Secure Flag's awesome. Just flat out state it. Uh, they have a partnership with OWASP. OWASP membership is really cheap. It's 500 bucks for a lifetime or 50 bucks a year uh, to be a full-blown member of OWASP. And if you're a member of OWASP, you have full unlimited use of this platform. And you can go take dozens, I think 100, I forget the exact number, it's over 100 types of trainings on here. Like full on capture the flag events, a whole community exists around this alone. So if you wanna go meet other cool people that are doing cool stuff, another way in. But along the way, you learn all about, you know, how to cryptography in Java or secure authentication in Java. I don't know why I picked Java when I made this, but I think Java was on my mind. Um, they also make a lot of publications and resources out there. A lot of these cross over with the projects, that's where they come from, but there also are physical books you can buy. Are they up to date? Eh, I don't know how time works, so maybe. Yeah, so they do a lot. And you're probably still thinking like, all right, what do I do with this? I could go spend four hours of my life digging through the projects, hoping to hit on something. Uh, I think there are four ways in that are really, really simple and actually practical day to day. First is the top 10. Who here knows or heard of or even looked up ever or saw a reference somewhere the OWASP top 10? Every hand in the room, almost every hand in the room. Some people are asleep, that's fine. It's the end of the day. Um, 10 types. Top 10 types of attacks going on in the world, vulnerabilities out in the world. I say type 10, 10 types of attacks. They don't say that, that's me. But that's a good way to think about it. Like, all right, I'm worried about my app being secure. What are the top ways I know I should secure it? Well, it's top 10 list. Every year it changes. They haven't come out with the 2022 list yet. Coming out later this year. I'm actually really curious to where cryptocratic, cryptographic, cryptographic failures will fall this year, if it goes up. It's gone up every year it's been on the list. Uh, broken access control um, is gonna probably stay at the top, but this is again me saying this. Um, the top eight are based on industry data. The last two are based on surveys of members saying, hey, what should else be on this list? So server-side request forgery isn't by data one of the biggest threats in the world, but all the members said, hey, this should be on the list. People should know about this. So it's not just a list and like, hey, good luck. It's a project. There's a repo for this. It goes really deep. I think the most important part of it is this one, how to prevent. There's a whole section. So if you're building an application and you're thinking, hey, how do I secure this thing? Go to the top 10, go to how to prevent for every single one, run through it, maybe just make a checklist. I'm a big believer that the best security tool ever invented is Excel spreadsheets because you can make a checklist. Real easy. Did we do it or not? Is the box checked? Make a big checkbox. Probably somebody already did that with this. You should probably just Google that. So that's top 10. Won't spend any more time on that. Cheat sheets. Man, I love cheat sheets. Cheat sheet series at OWASP.org. This is the one you should definitely visit if you don't visit anything else. Because you want to be an expert in 10 minutes on any subject good enough for your CIO, uh, CISO or your CIO, this is a website for you. They can walk in and say, hey, tell me about uh, Kubernetes security. And while you're talking to them, you can slowly Google or get to the OWASP cheat sheet and then a uh, quick scan over the page like, okay, I understand how this works now. It's a bare bones, like as fast as you can go, as fast as you can read it, overview of all the issues known. Is it complete and 100% thorough? No. Is it good enough to make you sound like an expert in 10 minutes? Yes. Uh, should you do this on the regular? Probably not, but this is a good way to start. If you've just taken a course in something and like, all right, I need a cheat sheet to hang out with me to remind me of the key things, they already wrote one for you. That's my point. So cheat sheets, definitely look them up. The goats, the goats are great. Goats are not the greatest of all time, maybe they are, but deliberately insecure applications. You wanna go see how not to build an application? They already did it. 
there's a bunch of them. Pi Goat, uh, Lab Projects, Wrong Secrets is awesome. I'm a very big fan of that one. We've done a whole webinar with them, uh, with the, the maintainer. Um, and it's how not to store your secrets, how specifically not to do it. There's a project to show you how to do it. But the greatest of all time of all of the goats is Juice Shop. Who here knows Juice Shop? Ah, uh, you're gonna love Juice Shop. This is the one to download. This is the one I got running a Docker container right now. I'll show you in a second. But Juice Shop is a fully functional, bug-free application that's completely insecure, according to the Wasp Top 10. Super well documented. Tons of articles about it. One of my favorite talks I've seen in the last year uh, is on YouTube from, uh, oh, from Bjorn. Uh, that breaks down how to use it. So Juice Shop looks like this. This is running my local. And yeah, it's just a, uh, it's a juice shop. But it can, uh, do I have my, still have my cross scripting in here? No, I don't. Uh, but if you go to, and this is like the secret, this is the thing, like you open it up, like I don't know what I'm doing. It's a built-in CFT, or uh, capture the flag, CTF. Uh, built in. So if you go to scoreboard, yeah, it's a full on tutorial on how to hack a website that tracks your progress as you go with tips and training as you go. Not just how not to build a website, but how to attack a website. All in one awesome thing you can run in a Docker container that you get up in seconds that scales. It's amazing. So Juice Shop, go check it out. Definitely should have it running. Zap, who's ever run the Zetatax proxy? Cool, we got one on the back, yes, yes. Zap is a tool you should be running, or at least run occasionally, uh, only against things that you control, that you own. You have permission to attack. Don't just go randomly attack websites with this, please don't. You could, but don't. Um, it's an automated scan that literally goes and attacks down the list and tries every dirty trick currently on the top 10 list. And then builds a nice report on what went wrong. So yeah, there's only nine alerts, but like cross domain in this configuration, there's 48 instances of that. Oh, this is against Juice Shop, by the way. This is how insecure Juice Shop is. So yeah cross-site scripting, session ID, URL rewrites. There are a lot of known bugs with, uh, with Zap, and that's why it's not in uh, the production-ready camp right now. Uh, and I've, previous conversations, is like, well, this tool isn't built for the enterprise, but at the same time, it is built for the enterprise. Anyway, oh, Zap is awesome. Download it, run it. These are the four ways in. But, all right, I'm gonna wrap up. It's dangerous out there. There is a group of people that wanna help you. They're called a WASP. They've been around for a long time. It's a Byzantine labyrinth to get through. But, if you go talk to the people involved, they're all nice. They all wanna share their knowledge. They all want you to succeed. They all want you to sleep better at night and have better security and stop writing insecure apps. And I would start here. Before last week, I probably wouldn't have said, start with Juice Shop, but Juice Shop is just fun. I've been having a lot of fun with it lately. Uh, when you get to the advanced things, it's like, wow, I've never even thought of that for application security. Um, Zap is a much quicker way to get to, like, how do I make my application secure, not how do I learn how to not write applica bad applications. But, but that's it. And if you don't know the top 10, that's one you should bookmark. And every time you think of building your application or changing your application, just go review the list. Anyway, I've been Dwayne. I'm a developer advocate, have been for a few years. Uh, hit me up on Twitter about anything, rock and roll. B-Sides Tech, I gotta fix that. But I do love B-Sides, they're an awesome organization. And uh, that's my talk. Any questions? 
Hi there. Yeah. Has there been any work in that arena, particularly in communities like the Hub admin? When I, I, I say the, the bug list, I mean the issue queue, and it's still there. That's, that's, the, com that's the conversation, that, literally the same conversation I had in West Virginia about, about Zap. Is, is an enterprise ready? According to them, yeah. Can you automate it? Ooh, there's problems with that. Uh, there's issue, known issues with it. Um, Unfortunately, but they do accept pull requests and they are open source. So if you can make it work, you can make it work. But that's not a great answer. <laughs> yeah. But I'm actually, you know what? I got enough time. Let's just let's just look. Autom automate. Oh, wasp. Zap. I haven't seen this before. This must be fairly new. So, there's a path. Well, there we go. 90% of what I know, I just Google or look up on DuckDuckGo. Any other questions? Anything I help other people with? Well, enjoy the rest of the event, and thank you very much for coming out to my talk. <laughs>